So we, we planned a video, and by planned, there's quotation marks around that. Mm. It was going to be ZFS versus BTRFS, but then neither one of us cared. So next topic. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, the Windows subsystem for Linux? Oh, yeah, the Windows subsystem for Linux. So you did you did a video on this. Yeah. And um, it, for me, it's been it's been a kind of a kind of validation because you know five or six years ago one of the first things that i wanted to share that i was really scared to share this there's several things that i have that i'm really sort of scared to share because people are kind of judgy and uh <laughs> it was uh, running windows on linux and mm. people were definitely very and continue to be very judgy about that because they're like no i was like you don't understand like i'm i'm the pragmatic it's like i'm just like the windows experience it, w it is a very Sisyphean task to try to replicate the Windows experience on Linux. Mm -hmm. And there are old programs and legacy programs and just crap that no one should have to bother trying to re-implement on Windows. And my heart goes out to the people, you know, Valve is funding it and, you know, like the game re-implementation and being able to play games natively on, on Linux. I love that they're doing that. It's great. Yeah. But, you know, let's not recreate the imperfections that are Windows on Linux, and there've been some really interesting things, like uh, the Vulkan, uh, the the DX, the D, uh, DXVK, yeah, DXVK, and the Vulkan stuff. Some of that has been portable back to Windows, mm -hmm. so you, they can take some legacy API stuff, like some legacy. I think it was DirectX nine, and translate that I into a Vulkan-ish API using code that was originally developed for Linux, and those games run better on modern hardware than they do with the code path that has been provided by Microsoft and or the game companies. Hmm. And so that's like, wow, okay, that's pretty neat. But weird edge cases like that aside, I just wanted to package up all that proprietary awfulness, stick it in a sandbox, and then be able to run Linux on the host operating system because I can keep an eye on it. And then Windows is in its own little sandbox and it's good. Because like with Windows, you turn off things and it's built into the kernel so hardcore. Hmm. Like uh, the analytics stuff. Like I was like, I'm going to disable IPv4, and it's like, oh, it's still <laughs> able to talk IPv4 in order to send telemetry. Yeah. So it's not really off. I can't trust the kernel. But no. I can trust the kernel inside another kernel. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Well, I think the last time I, I, I visited, uh, I, you showed me like how you had your VM set up, and I was like, well, that's really cool. Like I could I could see getting behind that. You know, having you know your your host system running Linux and then having Windows run underneath that yeah. or on top of it. I mean, and that's a way of ensuring that Microsoft isn't misbehaving. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, there's there's some audit, a little bit of auditability there. Yeah. Uh, the reverse of that, though, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was validation for me because Microsoft is doing it, and they're doing it well, and they're doing it in all the ways that are awesome. You don't have to have two GPUs because the way that I do it, you know, the price of admission is basically you got to buy another high-end GPU mm. or give Windows your high-end GPU, and then Linux has a less high-end GPU, which is fine if you don't play games on Linux. Right. It's a pretty high price of admission, and there, there could be hardware fixes to better allow... A host machine and a virtual machine to share that graphics horsepower, but it's not here yet because you know there's there's money to be made on that in the cloud, so we we can't give that to consumers. Um, but it's a kind of catharsis for me because there's a lot of adoption of the Windows subsystem for Linux on Windows. The reality is that if you're a web developer or JavaScript developing or you're using something like Go or even researchers. Windows is a dumpster fire. Mm -hmm. It is bad. It is genuinely bad because Microsoft just didn't care about those customers. You want to use the command line. PowerShell is almost not unusable these days. Like Microsoft's kind of finally getting it with the command line. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we need a, a good command line for repeatable things. It's like, oh, we don't. You know, it's a point and click GUI for Windows. And it's like, well, the point of being able to go through the command line on Windows is repeatability. I've got a fleet of 100 machines I need to manage. I want to run the same command on 100 machines and get the same result or yeah. be able to deal with that. It's like, configure the network through the GUI on 100 machines. Ugh. And then it's like, oh, we've got, we've got group policy. No. No, you don't. I mean, group policy is okay for some things, but... No. It's like, it, it wasn't invented here. Let's, let's invent... It's just, it's, it's a disaster. So yeah, the WSL2 is actually pretty good because it's got the Linux kernel in it and well, pretty good in terms of like implementation. So IO, FileWatch, things like that. All the stuff the developer wants is pretty good. Mm -hmm. 
but it's a kind of validation because you can have actually a pretty reasonable Linux experience on Windows. So you yeah. still got all the bad stuff of Windows. Windows is still in control of your machine, but you can experience the awesome goodness of Linux on Windows. Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, I can see that the the appeal, and I've I've truthfully seen a bunch of um, uh, YouTubers who are web developers or you know or like scientists who need Python, you know, and they are like on board with Windows Subsystem for Linux, and I can kind of see why that is important where i have an issue though is with DirectX yeah. being made available like that is that is like i feel i said in my video i feel like that's the most aggressive move microsoft has made against linux and open source software in as long as i can remember so there's a, there's a you're not i don't think you're wrong there's a really interesting way that that could be a trap for linux and that is software patents so imagine that you're, you know, sitting in Redmond and imagine that you're you're fairly evil. And so you're looking at what's happening with Steam. And so with Steam, with the re-implementation of a lot of these APIs, and you're looking at like what's happening, you're taking the Supreme Court's temperature here in the US and the whole mm. Oracle versus Google with their APIs. So, you know, as Microsoft, could you reasonably do enough saber rattling to threaten a company like Valve if your APIs are just proprietary enough and if your APIs are introduced into the open source world in some kind of a way. Like, could Microsoft plausibly say five years from now, hey, we introduced the DirectX API in the, in the Linux kernel in this way. Linux gaming is taking off. That's great. But that's Microsoft licensed code. That's ours. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of gamers that are running pure native Linux and they're running games that were designed for Windows on Linux through this emulation layer. Those are our APIs. Mm -hmm. They're not allowed to use that in that way. We do not license it that way. You know, with Wine, Wine's basically clean room-ish. But I really, like when I'm installing those uh, Visual C++ extensions, I'm really kind of worried about some of the clauses in the licenses yeah. where it's like, uh, this Visual C++ runtime, do I have a license to run this when I'm not running this with a license for Windows? Right. When I'm running Windows as a VM, even though I've got to give it a, 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 a video card, I'm a lot more confident from the licensing situation that it's like, hey, I've paid Microsoft their dues. If they're going to sue me and take this all the way to the Supreme Court, it's like, I think I'm using this product in a reasonable manner. I've given Microsoft their licensing fees. And yeah, they don't. their telemetry doesn't is not able to spy on every little thing that I'm doing on this machine. But I think that's reasonably allowed versus I'm going to re-implement their APIs, which I think re-implementing APIs should also be okay. Like I think Oracle versus Google is a farce. Yeah. But in the same way that it's a farce, I could see that the DirectX thing could be a similar kind of farce that would be a huge headache for Linux. Yeah. So I kind of I kind of agree with you, but for different reasons about the DirectX aspect of it. I worry about it. Yeah. I mean, like the a lot of people in the comments of my video were saying that uh, who cares? Like this is like a separate thing like you're only going to be able to use it on Windows subsystem for Linux like it's not going to be available for normal uh, bare metal Linux installations like not going to be a problem but like from from my perspective <laughs> but this developer took it and now we can run DirectX games on Linux somehow clearly there's been some hanky panky that's happened I mean not really mm. but you know, it's like the whole Oracle versus Google things. Oh, there's some hanky panky that happened here, and there's you know like one function that was like three lines, and it's like oh, that's tainted the whole case, mm. like we had with the Java thing. So I really worry about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I find it quite concerning, especially if developers like even if like you're do they're doing like machine learning stuff and they start using the the Microsoft APIs in Windows Subsystem for Linux. Well, then that's going to start making it so that all those applications rely on WSL. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people were like, well, why would anyone want to do anything like that? But there's many, many use <laughs> cases for WSL. Otherwise, Microsoft wouldn't be investing well, thousands of dollars. It's funny because it. the thing that you're worried about actually has already happened with CUDA because yeah. it's like, oh, I want to run this machine learning thing. And it's like all the how to's, everything on the entire Internet is CUDA. Yeah. NVIDIA has got that whole, that locked up because like Rock M and OpenCL yeah. are they're really good. And AMD has put a lot of work into it. And I've done a lot of work with uh, with uh, OpenCL and Rock M and some of the other stuff. But Microsoft needs to I mean, uh, AMD needs to hire about six evangelists to just do amazing things with Rock M and OpenCL to be able to promote it, to try to you know, 
get out of the stranglehold with that. And unlike NVIDIA or Microsoft, AMD has been almost completely open with all of the APIs and the interfaces for that mm. and the new GPU open, GPU open initiative. You know, it's like, it's another pro AMD thing, but they've actually done a good job trying to be good stewards of their API and explicitly giving you really good um, terms in the license to be able to run whatever. Yeah. Whereas with the Oracle stuff, you know, it's like even with ZFS, you know, ZFS was going to be bundled with Mac OS and then Oracle did some saber rattling and, and uh, uh, you know, Apple was like, okay, we're not going to bundle ZFS with Mac OS anymore. Mm. It's just crazy to me that like software patents and licensing like that can yeah. screw up so much. I can't believe the Java case. Like I cannot no. believe I really can't. And it's like, okay, Oracle is going to be able to, Oracle's probably going to win that case with where we are. And that is, that is a tragedy and that is yeah. wrong. I mean that, that case has been like sitting in the back of my mind as just a constant little nagging worry, you know, <laughs> yeah. for as long as it's been going. And it's like, that could do so much damage. Well, we'll know, we'll know if the uh, if the DirectX thing is a trap for Linux if Microsoft files an amicus brief on Oracle's side. It's like, yeah. oh, oh, no. well oh played, Microsoft. Well played. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> well, but they love Linux. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. They, they love Linux, but those heathens had better not take our intellectual property. Right. Didn't they have, weren't they like instrumental in forming like the patent uh, disarmament or whatever they called it? Yeah, yeah. It's where everybody cross licenses everything else. Again, that may be completely innocent intentions, but yeah. I still worry about it. Yeah. I do like, um, I will say that like Visual Studio Code, I love Visual Studio Code. I use yeah. the crap out of it. It's great. Uh, I really like what they're doing with like the command line and the terminal and stuff. These are, you know, they're actually trying to make their products more usable for the power users, mm -hmm. which is awesome. It's great to see Microsoft doing that. It's just that I don't trust the kernel because of the telemetry. Yeah. And I don't want to run their operating system on bare metal because of it. Yeah. Have you used SSH code? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, was that the extension for Visual Studio that does the SSH stuff? No. So what this is, is it's an application that uh, you run from the command line and it like will SSH into your server and then it will start a remote instance of, of VS code and then like pipe it back to you and then you open it up in your web browser and you can code well, uh, in the web browser. In the web browser. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, it's so super cool. I did the, uh, there's an extension for Visual Studio Code that'll make the remote file system like kind of like it's a local file system so you're still editing locally but whenever you save it's just saving remotely yeah and uh, i've used that and that is as slick as a ribbon yeah ssh fs is pretty cool as well where you can like mount ssh fs has some you know it's funny uh uh woofer is uh like he his boss was one of the original developers of that there's a guy that hangs out on our forum and uh they, it was like I'm having this problem with SSH FS. I'm losing my mind, and he was like, "Oh yeah, that's fixed in this pull request or whatever." And I was like, "Oh, thanks." <laughs> Small world. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So. I I was having trouble because I needed to like um, remote in and like have the file system there and edit some stuff for one of my clients, and uh, I didn't know. I like we were using Samba locally, and that was just a, a headache. Uh, and so I ended up using SSHFS and it was like just so much better. Oh man, it was so much better. I, <laughs> it struggles I a little anywhere. bit when you've got a million files, but yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Fun so, stuff. so WSL, it's cool if you want to get your feet wet with Linux. Mm. There's a potential dark side. Well, a real dark side, maybe, mm. and a potential dark side, but you know. You get you that much closer to if it gets you that much closer to running Linux on bare metal, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I think it's interesting, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to use it myself. Interesting is in may you live in interesting times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> interesting, like oh, my house might be on fire. <laughs> One moment, please. Let's see uh, what else was on the topic list that we had. We had a topic list. You know, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I can, I can, we can do the BTRFS versus ZFS a little bit. Yeah. Like, BTRFS is, they solve similar problems. They're architected in different ways. I'm going to just do a different, a separate video on ZFS. Just check that out. But BTRFS has similar ideas as ZFS in that it wants to 
be a file system that is aware of the underlying devices mm -hmm. so that it can store redundancy and parity information in a way that makes sense um, and can detect errors in a way that makes sense because it has to be aware of the underlying physical hardware on which the file system is implemented. But it doesn't have nearly as much development as ZFS. But ZFS is not great on large NVMe arrays yet. Mm. BTRFS is better. Uh, but BTRFS has much worse crash recovery than ZFS. Yeah. I have a BTFS installation uh, like on my home server. I've never used it for any of its like special abilities or anything like that. I like the snapshotting, but you can get that with LVM. Yeah. But it's not as clean. So it is nice having a file system that has, you know, LVM and snapshotting and blah, 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 features just all built in and rolled into one thing monolithically instead mm -hmm. of being an amalgamation of like 50 different things where, you know, the, the, there is a, there are leaks in the abstractions. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. where can they find you on the internet? Uh, I'm at the Linux gamer on YouTube and at the Linux gamer on, uh, library. Nice. If you haven't used library, check it out. It's really cool. And also Twitter. Oh yeah, Twitter at the Linux Gamer as well. Yeah, that's some that's some good consistency. Yeah, we didn't we are not that consistent at level one. <laughs> Every other account that I have though <laughs> is something completely different. <laughs> All right, well thanks for hanging out, and we'll catch you later. Thanks guys. <laughs>